families in that area. And I seriously doubt if the same kind of disaster hit a middle-class white area, the first response would be condoms and birth control. This idea that population control could be used to control a specific population was not unique to NSSM 200. For example, before the Nazis took power in Germany, abortion had been illegal except to save the life of the mother. But under Hitler, the Hamburg Eugenics Court ruled that it would still be illegal for Aryan women, but legal for women of what they called inferior racial stock. According to the court, encouraging eugenic abortions would promote racial hygiene and protect the health of the German people. This new policy eventually led to certain women being threatened with execution if they refused to abort what the Nazis called racially worthless babies. At about the same time this was going on in Germany, the government of Bermuda was blanketing the island with population control facilities and openly stating that their intent was to limit the numbers of blacks. Then in 1958, blacks in the Caribbean rebelled against a Planned Parenthood-led birth control campaign that was exclusively targeted at non-white residents, while at the same time, prosperous white residents were being encouraged to multiply. Following a similar pattern, a 1965 article in the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper reported that under apartheid, the white South African government was relying on targeted birth control as its primary weapon to reduce the number of blacks in the country. Unfortunately, we now know that the U.S. government was not immune to this sort of thing either. When three pro-choice researchers investigated the original motive behind the creation of the abortion pill, RU486, what they discovered was that the scientific basis for it was actually developed in the United States during the 1960s by the National Institutes of Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In their 1991 book, these researchers claimed to have found data showing that this agency was looking for an inexpensive and effective drug to control the populations of foreign countries that the government had classified as underdeveloped. The abortion pill was to be tested in these environments and, if successful, the plan called for it to then be introduced into black, Hispanic, and Native American communities in the United States. In 1977, only three years after NSSM 200 was issued, the director of the United States Office of Population, Dr. Reimert T. Ravenholt, publicly stated that it was the U.S. government's intention to sterilize one-fourth of the world's female population. According to Ravenholt, one of the driving forces behind this campaign was the need to protect American financial and commercial interests. Ravenholt said that some foreign governments were refusing to give the United States permission to come into their country and control their population. He said that, in those cases, the plan was to be carried out by two private organizations with an enormous amount of financial support from the American government. When asked by a St. Louis newspaper to name the two organizations, he said that they were the United Nations Fund for Population Activities and Planned Parenthood. Among government officials who supported the Ravenholt philosophy of using American intervention to control the populations of foreign countries, perhaps the most powerful were Republican President Gerald Ford, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. In the mid-1970s, while serving as foreign policy advisor to the Ford-Rockefeller administration, Kissinger personally helped Planned Parenthood set up an abortion counseling program for Vietnam refugees who were being housed at Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base in California. This was done despite the fact that the vast majority of these refugees were known to be strongly opposed to abortion and not one of them had ever requested abortion counseling. At the same time, Kissinger also refused to hold an abortion training program that was being conducted by the Agency for International Development, which operates under the direction of the State Department. Kissinger allowed this project to continue despite numerous complaints that it was in clear violation of U.S. law that specifically prohibited American foreign aid funds from being used for this purpose. The commitment that Ford, Rockefeller, and Kissinger had for this illegal project may have been a reaction to something Reimart Ravenholt had said a few years earlier. In 1973, he was speaking at a Planned Parenthood national conference where he told attendees that abortion may actually be the most demographically powerful way of controlling population. 
Ravenholt would eventually be honored by Planned Parenthood for what it called innovation and vision in the population field. Years ago, a series of USA Today articles documented that there are large multinational corporations on the New York Stock Exchange today that actually got their start in the slave trade. But when slavery ended and Africans could no longer be financially exploited, many of those same corporations began pouring millions into the eugenics movement. The people they had found so valuable as property, they had little use for as fellow citizens. And again, some of those corporations and foundations and institutions are still around today, and every year they still pour millions into eugenics organizations like Planned Parenthood. In fact, if you look at Planned Parenthood's donor list, it reads like a who's who of corporate America. You also have individual elit elitists doing the exact same thing. People like Bill and Melinda Gates, Warren Buffett, Ted Turner, and many others have used their own personal fortunes to make sure that the eugenics movement never runs short of money. Of course, if you confront these people or these corporations about their support for organizations like Planned Parenthood, they'll tell you it has nothing to do with eugenics. And if someone is naive enough to believe that, that's fine. But to me, it's like someone saying, yeah, I'll give a few million dollars a year to the Klan, but I'm not really a racist. After the abortion pill, RU-486, was approved for sale in the U.S., the controversy surrounding it kept the abortion lobby from being able to find an American company to produce it. That forced them to look for a foreign manufacturer. And after an eight-year search, a company owned by the Chinese government agreed to manufacture the drug for the U.S. market. The company's management made the decision after the Rockefeller Foundation agreed to provide financial backing for the project. There's also another connection between Rockefeller and RU486. At the end of World War II, the German chemical manufacturer IG Farben was identified as the company that supplied the gas used in the Nazi concentration camps. The gas was called Zyklon B, and evidence later showed that Farben's executives knew how it was being used. In fact, evidence was uncovered to indicate that Farben engineers had actually designed the gas chambers. This led to some of them being tried at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity, including genocide and slavery. Interestingly, I.G. Farben was a financial partner with John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil of New Jersey and a company called Standard I.G. Farben. In addition, within three months after Hitler came to power, the publicity director of Rockefeller Foundation and personal advisor to John D. Rockefeller, a man named Ivy Ledbetter Lee, was assigned the responsibility of directing public relations for I.G. Farben. After the war, I.G. Farben would change its name to become known as Hercht AG. Today, Hercht is a gigantic multinational corporation with subsidiaries all over the world, including the United States. Ironically, one of Hercht's subsidiaries, Roussal Ucloth, is the French company that developed RU486. In other words, the same company that produced the gas used in the Nazi death camps also produced the abortion pill that is now being used in American abortion clinics. And in both cases, there was a known connection to the Rockefeller Foundation. On the week he was inaugurated, Bill Clinton received this letter from attorney Ron Weddington. Weddington is the ex-husband of Sarah Weddington, the lawyer who successfully argued for the legalization of abortion in the Roe versus Wade case. 26 million food stamp recipients is more than the economy can stand. You can start immediately to eliminate the barely educated, unhealthy, and poor segment of our country. No, I'm not advocating some sort of mass extinction of these unfortunate people. Crime, drugs, and disease are already doing that. I am not proposing that you send federal agents armed with Depo Provera dart guns to the ghetto. You should use persuasion rather than coercion. Our survival depends upon our developing a population where everyone contributes. We don't need more cannon fodder. We don't need more parishioners. We don't need more cheap labor. We don't need more poor babies. Two days after being sworn in as president, 
Bill Clinton issued an executive 